Hey, what is going on everybody? And my apologies for not having a war video today. I am a bit behind due to being away from my COVID shot. So just wanted to get this out here first. Next week we'll be back to the usual War Wednesday. But today I want to talk to you guys about what I think about Gamora and Nebula's rework that was brought to us in the blog post just recently, which was a surprise that they didn't actually wait until Friday. I guess they must have some other plans there. But I also want to go over my thoughts on Adam Warlock now that I've had more time to think about this and also what it means for free to play and pay to win players and whether or not he'll actually be possible at all to obtain for people who don't spend or don't spend a lot now i'll be going over my spreadsheet character data which will tell us you know what we're looking at exactly in terms of a timeline but also what the timelines were for both jubilee and doc ock in terms of character farmability and i, I think that might help us determine whether or not it might be possible at all for free-to-play players to unlock Adam Warlock, or if he'll be solely a paid legendary unlock. So that's what I hope to answer in this video, and hopefully you guys will stick with me today. So without further ado, let's get this show started. And to start things off, we're just going to really quickly go over the blog post that was brought up uh, last night, which has to do with the Gamora and Nebula rework. We're just going to scroll through this a bit. So basically, Gamora has an empowered form now, which we'll get to down below. These are the enhancements to her abilities, which is pretty crazy. Uh, so her basic now attacks primary target for 290% plus applies to bleed and guarantees two bonus attacks for 240%. So this is a whopping amount of damage. I'm assuming this is all with T4s in mind. So that's 480 uh, plus 290. That's like 770% um, damage. <laughs> that's a lot. Special bring to ruin. This is available on turn two. Now I'm assuming uh, just kind of like Thanos empowered form that the energy cost, uh, uh, the, her ability energies will change when she turns into her empowered form. But a clear death proof from all enemies if enemy, if an any enemy had death proof, apply one death proof up to a maximum of three to all Infinity Watch allies. So that's a lot. Uh, this is probably a giant fu to like um, uh, Black Order still, because if uh, Call of Obsidian had death proof, then boom, apply one uh, death proof up to a max of three. So that's crazy. Uh, attack all enemies for 400% damage plus apply heal block for two turns. Again, a bit of an fu to the heal block that uh, the regens give on Black Order and other characters, you know, as well, maybe in War Offense, things like that. This attack, the attack cannot miss. Ultimate Requiem, uh, this is also available on turn two. G gain offense up for two turns. Attack primary target for 600. That's a pretty high number, I'm pretty sure. On kill, fill speed bar by 100%. This is very similar to her old ultimate. Uh, this this attack can't be dodged or blocked. Passive, now this is huge, there's a lot of stuff here, and actually there's more down below. So if health is at full, at the start of the match, revive once with 20% of this character's max health, plus 20% per Infinity Watch ally. So with a full Infinity Watch team, she's reviving for basically 100% HP. I think this is going to be a common theme across Infinity Watch. Uh, Nebula has something like this, but it's a little bit uh, weaker by very slightly. So I imagine that a lot of the Infinity Watch characters are going to have some sort of revive mechanic. On turn, flip defense up on any enemy that has defense up so I don't know if that's gonna have a focus versus resistance check but still that's kinda crazy when this character's health drops below 30 percent apply taunt to the highest health ally and gain two regen for self so just in case she gets hurt uh, a lot uh, there's gonna be some sort of tank mechanic off tank mechanic for the other characters uh, that is pretty good and what's interesting about this is it's not specific to infinity watch it actually could happen to anyone if you happen to be using her but this is the i believe the empowered version i don't know if this is on the other one the base passive as well uh, gain 15 percent piercing for each each infinity watch ally 10 percent crit chance uh, guardian and infinity watch allies gain 10 percent crit chance more crit chance for you yeah. so this is the same and this part here gain 10 thousand percent resistance against defense down so uh no defense down from kestrel i guess is what i'm getting out of that one uh and the piercing is pretty nice uh this actually happened on colleen wang's passive isn't it piercing for heroes for hire so something similar huge base stat increase uh double the health now uh damage plus 40 percent 600 percent armor focus and resistance 20 percent so this is pretty much the same uh this gets changed here though the special ruthless blade this is outside of the empowered form so now it guarantees chains to two adjacent targets. This might require T4s though. On kill, fill speed bar by 100%, that's the same. Uh, but if Adam Warlock is an ally, this attack can chain to stealth targets and cannot be countered. So that's kind of nice. 
ultimate. Uh, looks like the damage probably just went up. It looks to be the same. Offense up for two turns instead of one turn, I think. And otherwise, the speed bar is the same. Uh, the passive. So this is what's important. On spawn, gain plus one charge for each infinity wa non infinity watch ally. So uh, in order to get to her empowered form, she has to. She loses a charge every single turn. We'll, so we'll see that here. On this character's or any infinity watch ally's turn, lose one charge. On any Adam Warlock's turn, lose two charge instead. On turn, if not charged, become empowered. So she needs to lose all of these charges. So if she's on the field with four non-Infinity Watch allies, she's going to have four charges. So she needs to get through four charges uh, before she can do that, uh, before she gains empowered. So if she's by herself, let's say on a Guardian team because they're not Infinity Watch, uh, that they're going to take four turns for her to turn into a power. So, you know, whether or not the fight lasts that long or not, I don't know. Uh, but the fact remains is that she will be able to become empowered whether or not she's on Infinity Watch or not. But I think on turn, basically if you have a full Infinity Watch team, basically turn one she's gonna go in power so that's pretty neat here uh, and again we got all the same stuff on empowered fill speed bar by 50 percent plus clear all negative effects from self heal for 50 percent if negative effects were removed heal 10 percent per negative effect removed so basically she's almost full healing and she's gaining a lot of speed bar to get to her next turn once she does become empowered again she keeps all this other stuff the crit chance and the resistance and so it's pretty nuts uh there's some animations here i'm not going to play them but yeah if you do want to see them they're pretty cool uh, so Gamora got the big end of the stick here on the rework. Nebula also receives some improvements too. Uh, I think it just kind of brings her in line though. It's nothing crazy. Uh, but if you do see here, basically the the basically the basic uh so now we have an increase in damage goes up to 320 percent damage and it's 10 percent of target's max health so you'll see why that's crazy when we get to the assist uh the special challenging foes so this is the same kind of in increase the damage by a lot and now it applies to counter to all infinity watch allies the ultimate though this was changed a fair bit so now it does more damage applies heal block chains up to two adjacent targets also applies heal block but if this character has three or more infinity watch allies chain to 10 targets now i don't know when you're gonna need that many uh but it's there uh so i don't think that a chain is not a rebound though so it can only hit the same target once unless that was meant to be rebound but i think chain is different in this case a uh, gain to evade and then apply evade to all infinity watch allies so more defense there you get the evade you get the counter attack for infinity watch allies uh so that is nice always crits if they're summoned or cloned uh, the new passive though this is good again on spawn gain speed up if health is at full at the start of the match revive so you get the revive mechanic but it's only 75 percent with the full infinity watch team so 10 percent plus 15 percent times four so 60 plus 10 oh wait that's 70 percent sorry not 75 what was i i'm not sure what i was saying there 70 percent max health still a lot on revive gain death proof so she's getting death proof and then on revive pretty sure that counts as a spawn as well so she might be getting speed up again as well uh and then she gets to uh, assist now to random gamoras and speed up to gamora uh on her turns and what's nice about this is it with a full infinity watch team she's got a 100 percent assist rate now what's interesting about this is because her basic again 10% of the target's max health. So every single time that a character on the Infinity Watch team is attacking, they're going to be assisting for 10% of Nebula's max health. Uh, sorry, of the target's max health. Nebula is going to be draining, or not draining, but in this case, just dealing that much damage, which is a fair bit. And I'm wondering this 10% of max health, if this counts as a sort of drain mechanic in the sense that it could pierce through death proof, because that's how like Minerva's and Ghosts and everyone else's sort of uh, the, the percentage health actually goes right through the death proof. So I'm very curious to see if that's the case with this as well. So yeah, some really nice reworks to Nebula, but I think realistically, if you're, you're not really going to want to use her still, I think, unless you're uh, using her with the Infinity Watch team. Gamora, on the other hand, uh, does have a lot of improvements, but you might be able to use her outside the Infinity Watch team perhaps uh, but arguably this is still meant to be used for the team so this is crazy here guys uh, let me know what you think about the reworks for Gamora and Nebula in the comments down below but let's get to the second half of the video which is me talking all about Adam Warlock and whether or not we're having any chance of unlocking him either free to play or uh, even lightly spending or if this is gonna be a heavy spending event let's jump on over to the spreadsheets 
All right, guys, so here we are in my character spreadsheet uh, here. You guys may be familiar with this. I've kind of brought this up in other videos in the past. Basically, this is just my data for all the character releases. Essentially, since uh, early last year, at the start of 2020, I started collecting this data. It's not complete, but I am working on it as I go along, which includes pre-release offer dates, uh, the free-to-play release dates, how the release method, when they're available in orbs, when they're available in the Elite Store, when they become farmable, the method that they become farmable, and uh, the days in between uh, when they were released in the pre-offer or the pre-release and uh, when they actually became farmable. So uh, what I want to get started here, we're going to look at X-Factor because uh, that's important to know how long has it been since uh, they've been out. And we're going to bench that against characters that were used for Jubilee, the Pym Tech, and we're also going to bench that against uh, X-Force for Doc Ock. So we can kind of take a look at what to expect here. So to start things off, we'll start at the top here uh, with Sharistar and Longshot. Now, they were the most, uh, the oldest X-Factor characters. They were released in December here. Uh, so we see here December 8th and December 17th for the pre-release offers. And now it's been, you know, anywhere from five to six months, 159 days for Longshot, 168 days for Shatterstar. So that's, yeah, that's like five and a half months that it's been. That's quite some time. It's a bit uh, out of the ordinary when it comes to farmable legendaries, I think, when we go to look at Pimtech and X-Force. Uh, but when we go down, because it's been a couple of patches till we got Multiple Man and Polaris, so it's been 50 days since we got Multiple Man and 43 now, I think that's accurate, uh, since Polaris' pre-release of 12th of April, we're at uh, the 25th of May. I think that's pretty accurate there. So those are the characters that are going to be most concerning. Actually, Polaris is definitely going to be the most concerning. Hands down, we know that Polaris is going to be the hardest one to farm. We only had, uh, we're going on to the second strike pass soon. So for free to play players for, for Polaris, we're only going to have a hundred shards available outside of any luck from the orbs. Now, Polaris was made available in the orbs on May the 3rd, so she is in there, and same with the other X-Factor characters, of course, but for Polaris, because this is the first time, outside of that Silver Surfer, that a brand new character was released through the Strike Pass method, so uh, if you count the two Strike Passes that's coming around for Polaris, you're going to have a total of 100 shards, if you do spend and you buy the Strike Passes, that still only puts you at 200 shards, and so it really depends on what kind of luck that you've maybe had from Premium Orbs, Ultimus Orbs, Mega Orbs, whatever, uh, since that since it's been as of recording this video it's been about uh 20 something days uh that polaris has been available in the orb so maybe you got lucky maybe you got uh, some orb drops in there and that's great and that'll add to that total uh but otherwise you're looking at 100 free to play 200 if you if, if you now i know the second strike pass hasn't finished but that's what it's going to be 100 for uh free to play 200 for if you spend and bought the strike passes plus any orb drops now uh let's take a look at pim tech and we can kind of get to see the ideas of how long was it before they were made farmable and also between the events for the legendary so let's look at uh, uh let's look at jubilee here so jubilee's release was 8th of february 2021 i don't know why that says 2020 that's that's wrong uh 8th of february let's save that 8th of february 2021 now Pimtech is the characters that were made farm. Uh, sorry, were made for this legendary event. So let's scroll up and look at that. This patch here. So that's stature, ghost, and yellow jacket. I'm not going to look. At, you know, we don't know care about what wasp ram and their farmable. So they were a total of 82 days, 69 and 65 days since they were released when they were became farmable. Now we can kind of take that and look at what multiple man down here. I think I'm blocking it. Uh, multiple man is 50 and 43. Multiple man and Polaris 50 and 43. So we're not quite there yet. Uh, but let's take a look in comparison into the event for Jubilee. So again, where are we? Uh, back down here. So hopefully I'm not in the way. There we go. Uh, so Ghost was made in the Warstar. We know that. Stature was a node at Cosmic 1-9 and Yellow Jacket was also a node. So we have two characters here in the Pym Tech that were on a node. One was in the Warstar. You know, Ghost was widely seen as uh, the harder to farm here, but we did get those... Um, uh, the Dark Dimension 4 orbs, uh, the Champion orbs or whatever, that helped us get more shards for Ghost if that was what you're trying to do for Yellow, uh, for Jubilee, <laughs> you know, in order to farm. So I think I did pick up a few of these orbs for Ghost. Uh, but if we look January 20th, that was the date that Ghost was made farmable in the War Store and Jubilee's event down here was the 8th of February. So that's roughly, uh, you know, 8, 11, 8 days, 19 days. Uh, plus I think the event ran for 5 days, so this was the start of the event. So you might have had like about three weeks or so to farm up ghost 
And But if you look at the other ones, the 25th of January, so this is just under three weeks, like two and a half weeks, I think, for Stature and Yellow Jacket to get uh, ready for Jubilee's event. Now, I think Yellow Jacket was still a bit of a grind for some people because he was initially a Blitz character, and that's what made people struggle to get the to get Yellow Jacket up to five star before the Jubilee event. So this was a little bit more player friendly in that sense. You know, I know a lot of people still didn't get Jubilee, but there was about two to three weeks available that you could power farm some of these characters if you really wanted to. And if you blitzed really well on these events before, there was still a chance that you could get them. Now, uh, let's kind of go back the way and look at Doc Ock. So Doc Ock's event was on the 21st of September. Again, I'm pretty sure it ran five days on the first uh, pass. And then let's look at X-Force in terms of the farmability before then. So uh, I believe it's up here. So we have Domino, Negasonic, and X-23. So what's important is here, days since release. So they were made farmable 63 days for Negasonic, 77 for X-23, and 85 for Domino before, you know, when they got released, to when they became farmable. So those numbers are pretty interesting. All between two months and three months. And I, I believe it's the same for uh, the Pimtech as well. They were 65, 69, 82. So all within three months. So I know for Shatterstar and Longshot, we're well past that date. So that's going to happen soon. I'm going to talk about more about what I think about their release methods are going to be. Uh, but Polaris and Multiple Man... If we're if we're going between two and three months, what that really means is that Polaris is going to be the last one to be made farmable, and that might not be for another three weeks from now, and it might be like towards the end of the strike pass. We're gonna, you know, I'm not. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Uh, Multiple Man, on the other hand, was data mined to be in Doom War three nine, replacing Taskmaster. But again, fifty days. Uh, you know, he might not be made farmable until the start of June, maybe mid-June, who knows, right? So there's still some time there in terms of the other characters. But let's go back to X-Force again. And so the hardest one to farm here for this undoubtedly was X-23. I'm pretty sure that was the, the biggest challenge because uh, Negasonic was actually made available on the 19th of August. She was the first one that was made farmable 63 days after her character release. And this was on Doom War Chapter 1-9. So even though it was a later uh, Doom War chapter in this case, it was a later campaign and an on a node, it was made, you know, between August 19th and Doc Ock's event, which was September 21. That was about a month, just over a month, you know, that you could farm her so you know if you did get this note unlocked you could still power farm this really quickly uh, but Domino was made available in the Blitz Orbs. Again, as much as I hate the Blitz Orbs, I think it's very easy to do. A lot of us have stockpiles on Blitz Creds, so I don't think this is a very challenging one to get either. Uh, and she was a campaign event, so most people would have had her probably in the four-star level uh, after her event, so that wasn't really a big tricky one there either. Uh, but it was X-23 for Doc Ock, from what I remember, that was the more challenging one. So she was made available on the 15th of September. This is important. Now look at this, 15th of September, Doc Ock's event was the 21st of September. Okay, so that's six days that they had between X-23 being made farmable and uh, the pa first pass of the Doc Ock event. Now, this was a five-day event, so, you know, feasibly, that would be to the 26th of September here, looking at that date. So you might have had 10 or 11 days to farm X-23 out of the War Store before his event left. Now, I know that Doc Ock was, I think, a lot more challenging for people to get on the first pass than Jubilee was. I think in my alliance, there was only, like, me and a couple others that picked up Doc Ock on the first pass, whereas Jubilee, I think maybe more about eight or so picked up Jubilee on the first pass. So I think Doc Ock was a lot harder in that case. So if we take a look at that timeline, that's like, what, six days before the event that X-23 was put into the War Store. That's pretty rough. So let's go back and let's talk about X-Factor some more. So Shatterstar, I have a feeling that because he's been in the RTA season I kind of think he is going to be Arena Orb number two. Now, I suggested back when I thought that uh, Astonishing X-Men was going to be the farmable team for this uh, legendary. I was wrong. Uh, I, I was not wrong about Jubilee. I did think it was going to be Astonishing X-Men and Jubilee, but hey, uh, apparently it's X-Factor and Jubilee for some odd reason. Uh, sorry about that. Anyways, so I do think it's going to be Arena Orb number two. Now... It could be Longshot Arena Orb number two, but I think Longshot might get the War Treatment. Uh, I don't actually think that the War Store is the hardest farm there is. I actually think that the Arena Orb would be the hardest farm to do. If you guys watched my video where I pulled uh, shards, tried to pull shards for Scream out of the new Arena Orb, it was absolute garbage. Now, 
On the plus side, though, Shatterstar was a campaign event. He's been in a couple of orbs as well. He's been in the Voyager orbs for Kestrel. He's been in the Gamma raid orbs. So there are other opportunities to get shards for Shatterstar. For Longshot, there, uh, I think he was also in the Voyager orb, but on a whole, there was less. Pla there are less places to get Longshot shards other than just getting lucky in the orb. So. He was a Blitz 100 character. I think it's still going to be a struggle for some people to pick up the long shot shards in time, especially if they make it really tight. Again, if you look at Ghost, Ghost was um, a Ghost was a little bit more lenient. There was like about three weeks, I think, there between Ghost's uh, release in the War Store and uh, Jubilee. But then again, if you go back and look at Doc Ock, you know, the 21st of September, like I said, X-23 was the 15th of September. That's six days. So they could be as mean as that, guys. I mean, so be careful. Make sure that you hoard as much resources as you possibly can. Arena credits, war credits, Blitz credits, who knows? I highly doubt that these characters are going to be put into the Blitz store, I think, or a Blitz orb. That's incredibly unlikely given how powerful they are, but you never know. Uh, so just save all of your resources when it comes to the stores because you're going to need as much as you possibly can if you want any hopes of unlocking Adam Warlock. And that's where I want to kind of get towards the end here when we talk about Multiple Man and Polaris. So again, Multiple Man and Polaris, I think these are going to be... Multiple man might be put up a bit more quicker because we did get a data mine about Doom War 3 9. But still, he, you know, if you do, he was a campaign event as well, just like Shatterstar. But if you are missing shards for him, make sure that you, you know, you core that depending on how late they leave it. What we need to talk about though is Polaris. And that's what I kind of want to end the video with is talking about Polaris. And I have a big question, question, question because I don't know. I don't know what they're going to do with this, given how many shards we know that we could possibly get for Polaris. Like I said, 100 free to play, 200 if you buy both of the strike passes. That still puts you in a pretty precarious position to unlocking Adam Warlock via Polaris, because I think that's going to be the crunch. I think the second crunch might be long shot because he was a Blitz character, and a lot of people don't have uh, shards for him versus Multiple Man and... Um, uh, and Shatterstar. But Polaris is really going to be the big crunch here. The question is... Are they going to make her farmable? Let's say, hypothetically, we go back to Black Bolt, uh, the release of Black Bolt, which required as Guardians, uh, Hela was not made farmable, and Heimdall, I think, was also not made farmable, even though he was a campaign event, uh, prior to the first pass of Black Bolt. Now, there was a lot of complaints about that, because the amount of people who did unlock him was very minimal, but let's say, for sake of argument, that Polaris is not made farmable before the first pass of Adam Warlock. I think that's highly possible given this new criteria that they're calling it of a mythic legendary event. I think that this is actually possible. On the other hand, uh, you know, if you are someone who didn't buy any of the strike passes, good luck. You know, even if they do make a, make her farmable, there's a possibility that you might have a week at best. You know, given what we know about uh, X-23's position in the war store, you know, that was less than a week before Doc Ock's event. If Polaris gets a similar treatment in a different method, you know, seven days, less than seven days when you're at 100 shards and you need 210, good effing luck. I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, and even if you're, even if you bought both strike passes and you're sitting at 200 out of 310, plus maybe some orb drops here and there over the next little while, you know, you're still going to need, I would say, anywhere from 75 to 100 shards, you know, to do that. And that's still a lot depending on what her method is going to be. I'm not going to guess as to what that's going to be, but I think there's a high possibility that she might not actually need made farmable and they want to make this team very exclusive the infinity watch looks like it's going to be uh black order 2.0 on the arena defense a meta arena defense team with safeguard from adam warlock and all the stuff that we already know about gamora and nebula with the revive mechanics i think this is going to be the giant brick wall meta for arena defense i guess they could be probably usable in war defense but specifically i, I want to talk about arena defense because they're going to be just screwing everyone over there and so i want to think that they're trying to kind of gouge, uh, not gouge us, uh, uh, squeeze us for more money as much as we can, especially in relation to Polaris. So I'm not saying that Polaris isn't going to be made farmable. I think that it could not be farmable. I think there's a chance there. And if not, if they do make her farmable, I don't think it's going to be very friendly, guys. I think that they want to make this event very tough to clear. I think they don't want as many people doing it, or they want people to spend big big dollars in order to get Adam Warlock unlocked. But that's just what I think, guys, based on the data that I've seen and I collected. Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. How much do you think they're going to squeeze us for Adam Warlock? Do you think it's going to be free-to-play possible? Do you think it's only going to be pay-to-win possible? I honestly think 
Um, even the, the people who buy Polaris, uh, the strike passes are going to struggle. Now, if you pre-purchase Polaris's offer, the character offer, on top of both of the strike passes, that puts you in a really good position. But if you didn't even buy Polaris's pre-offer, and you just buy the strike passes, I think there's still a possibility that you might struggle. So keep that in mind when you're gonna, <laughs> if you're trying to get Adam Warlock and you purchase the strike passes, but that's just me guys. Uh, so yeah, that's the end of this video. Just wanna see what you guys think about Adam Warlock. I've had some time to think about it and I just don't know. Am I gonna get it? I don't know. I don't know if I'm gonna pick up Adam Warlock or not. Even if I were to buy the strike passes, I would still be down some shards. I don't know if they're gonna make them farmable, make her farmable, uh, but I think it's gonna be a struggle for a lot of us. And even without looking at the new characters coming, which I believe is gonna be Phyla, Vel, and Moondragon, and that's a topic for another discussion, uh, I don't know if it really matters because really it just come down to, are we gonna get Adam Morlock? If not, the Infinity Watch team might not be worth chasing. So that's the end of this, guys. I'll see you next time on my next video. Until then, stay safe, and I'll see y'all later. Oilon signing out.